Great. So I saw a few more a few more numbers trickle in uh, in those two minutes. So uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on advanced acceleration technology. Uh, this is specific to the uh, Siemens offerings. Uh, my name is Cameron Ingham. I'm part of the uh, advanced acceleration technology uh, task and finish group for IPEM. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. I should ask that you all direct your questions to the chat box. We'll select a few questions at the end of Simon's presentation and go through them with him. Um, if we need to ask you any more information on your questions, we might invite you to lift, uh, raise your hand, but otherwise you're all going to be muted during the presentation and we can't see your videos. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, it's going to be, hopefully the recording is going to be made available on the IPEM conferences YouTube channel by the end of the day, if not probably later, uh, start of next week. So, uh, seems like we should be better get going really. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Simon Shah. So Simon's the principal MR physicist at Geyser St. Thomas's, and he's going to talk to us a bit about the advanced acceleration technology offering by Siemens. Uh, do you want to take over sharing, Simon? Thank you, Cameron. Uh, yes, I will take over sharing. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yep, we can see it. Excellent. Thank you, Cameron. Right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be covering uh, the advanced acceleration technology uh, that is provided by Siemens. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to be covering what we mean by AAT, um, give you some practical advice in terms of user implementation, and then show you through some example images, sequences, protocols that have been uh, developed at sites around England. I also discuss some of the challenges with the technology and then the patients and services benefits that you get out of this. So sort of to give you a bit of a reminder, um, this is the third webinar, uh, but there have been two previous on GE and uh, there was an overview and next week there's a Philips one. Uh, Cameron's already mentioned that there is an IPEM task and finish group. This formed last year. Um, and this formed of a group of uh, physicists around the UK who are also interested in this technology, but also to provide the benefits and support the community as a whole. And also the main sort of benefit we're looking for is trying to increase patient throughput. I will also be discussing some of the additional aspects of uh, AAT in terms of image quality, uh, but the main focus will be looking at shortening scans. So in terms of Siemens, what do we mean by AAT or this acceleration technology? Because acceleration in MR has existed since its conception in the 70s. We all use it at the moment. Uh, and so for those who are using Siemens scanners, which hopefully most of the people on this call are, we call Grappa maybe our main acceleration technique that we use. For the rest of the talk, when I talk about AAT, this covers some of the more recent implementations that the Siemens have provided. So simultaneous multi-slice, SMS, the compressed sensing implementation that they call compressed sensing or CS, and then their artificial intelligence software. And that's deep resolve gain, sharp and boost, and also in addition, deep resolve swift brain. So if we start off and look at simultaneous multi-slice, well, the way that this works it's quite simple. Conventionally, when we're acquiring images, which are 2D, we use a single slice excitation. And we do this conventionally, either moving through up and down the body as we're acquiring these slices. The way simultaneous multi-slice works is you acquire more than one slice at the same time. And then we have some form of reconstruction where we so separate these two slices out. So the RF pulse is composite and it provides two slices or more at once. And then we use the coil information to unwrap the data. So, okay, we we'll won't come onto it, but naturally this benefits with imaging where you've got multiple coils. So it's easier to separate out the data. So in terms of what Siemens provide and what they offer, and they offer it on their 1.5T and 3T systems, um, they have some functionality on um, their VE11 software for EPI and DWI readouts. And on their latest software version, so the XA software version, they have these TSE readouts, which obviously is very beneficial for a lot of our clinical protocols. Um, and this does include the Dixon sequences. 
and they also have now implemented it on the Resolve DWI. I mentioned it here, but when we come on to it, the most reliable factor to use is two, uh, but you can go up to eight in fMRI. So when it comes to compressed sensing, if we think about the way in which we image conventionally, we acquire points in K-space and we do a Fourier transform and we get our image as in a very broad brush. And a lot of the image in terms of the, the structure of the image is found within the center of K-space and the finer details are found out here. But to go beyond sort of the conventional parallel imaging of Grappa, we need to use the sparsity image of K-space to accelerate further. So we could sample less in K-space and do it in, intermittently in a sort of a, uh, in, a, in a coherent way. But if we did our conventional Fourier transform like this, we get an image which looks a bit like this, which isn't what we want. So we have to develop a method instead to try and remove the noise elements that we have enhanced in this image. So how do we go about doing this? So this is a nice little sort of simple diagram to explain the method. So again, we incoherently randomly sample K-space and we capture as much detail. We apply what we call a wavelet transform, which manages to subtract out the noise out of the image. We then convert this back into our image and then we compare it. So we, we do an iterative, we compare the optimized data versus data consistency. So have we taken out enough noise out of the image? Have we taken out too much? And then we have to go back into the algorithm and go around again. And so defining what your max iterations or threshold is, is gonna be uh, your compressed sensing factor. Uh, so the more noise you're allowed to allow in. Again, with Siemens, they offer a wide range of compressed sensing. So they initially brought out compressed sensing at V11 or later for their CINES. And then on their later XA version of their software, you have the compressed sensing for space, for time of flight, for CMAC, and for GROSP VIBE. So if we sort of look through these step by step in terms of what they are. So Simon, I just think you've frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> Hopefully Simon will pop back in. And if so, I'll ask him to go back over or something if we've missed it. Okay, right, we're, we're back. Okay, so I touched on CS Cine. Uh, so you've got compressed sensing space, which is um, for 3D acquisitions for T1, T2, and flare imaging. And these are naturally predominantly used in neuroradiology. So the application of CS for space is only limited to those really in that, who are imaging that area. And the same again for the time of flight. Separately, we have uh, compressed sensing for CMAX, so for metal artifact reduction sequences. So these might be beneficial for sites who are doing um, lots of MSK metal work, which CMAX is inherently very long. And then we've also got CS Grass Vibe, uh, which is for motion insensitive volume imaging. I'm not gonna touch on this, but it's got very inherently uses in sort of perfusion imaging or abdominal imaging for contrast. And then finally, um, deep resolve. Um, so Siemens package things up and call things deep resolve and then they have spin-offs. Um, it's a marketing, I'm sure. But let's touch on what artificial intelligence is. So it's the next paradigm really shift in terms of accelerating imaging protocols in MR. And why is this? Well, we've got to the limit effectively with compressed sensing, with GRAPA, with simultaneous multi-slice and to get things further, we have to move into the next realms of imaging. Now, all the previous techniques that we've discussed or implemented or you know about, do a Fourier transform uh, of K-space and get you your image. And it doesn't really use any prior knowledge to know that actually what, the what your K-space image is before you do the Fourier transform. 
artificial intelligence uses this technique where it know we already know that our case base is going to be of a brain it might not be what it is at the moment but we pre we know what's there so we can use this information and that is effectively what artificial intelligence is and so i'm just going to do a little bit of a an overview of how these work now deep learning algorithms there's loads of them out there there's loads of implementations of them they are black boxes as well as is a lot of uh, the stuff that siemens have um so how does it work well again you highly undersample case space um, much more than you did when you were doing compressed sensing. And if you do a reconstruction of that image, if we did this kind of sampling, we get this sort of image, like lots of fold over artifacts uh, appearing. But if we plugged it into what we call a, like a unit deep learning algorithm, which has been trained on previous MR images of healthy volunteers or patients, it's trained to recognize certain patterns in the MR image and it builds them down and then rebuilds them up. And when, whilst it does this and it's learned the, what these images look like, it can then shoot out an image of the brain, which is quite surprising. Um, and then again, a little bit like how comp uh, the compressed sensing works, we have to do a bit of sanity checking. We have to check that we haven't faked any sort of data. So we compare with the previous first images so we haven't put anything extra in that we think is fake, um, and then we get our image out. So what do we have in terms of Siemens? Well, we have the Deep Resolve Gain and Sharp, and these were made first available on the XA20 software. Um, and then on the most recent range of software, the XA50 and 51, you can have Deep Resolve Boost, and we have this thing called Deep Resolve Swift Brain. So those who partook in the most recent round of capital funding that NHS England provided uh, at the back end of last year, uh, most sites with Siemens scanners were provided with the Deep Resolve Boost and the Swift and again the Sharp. So what is Deep Resolve Gain? Well, it's not actually an artificial intelligence really technique it's sort of being captured under that hood but it removes the noise from the MR image using the fact that um, the noise in the image is actually not uniform so it has noise maps uh, it's learned from the fact that we've got certain coil combinations or looks in that image we then do a wavelet denoising techniques so we remove the noise and we get out our boosted SNR image so in a sense it is a form of compressed sensing Deep Resolve Sharp is an artificial intelligence technique. So it's been tra trained on loads of MR images of pairs of data. So images from one person, one low res, one high res scan, and it's been paired up. And so the network has learned where to detect sharp edges in the images um, so that you can acquire low resolution images and it outputs high resolution images. So if you feed into the network, the low resolution, it's then matching up pairs and it's been trained to learn where the data lies and it outputs this wonderful image. I've taken this from Siemens Marketing, which is on the link below, but it shows sort of how it works. And then finally, um, Deep Resolve Boost, it's their latest generation of software. So it's replaced Deep Resolve Gain. Um, and it's again, another set of deep learning neural networks, but there's multiple of them this time that have been put into the um, into the algorithm. Um, they So when you've got highly undersampled data, it's felt, fed in, it's run through multiple of these to remove the noise and boost the signal uh, to get your final output. And this data has been trained on um, an incredibly large amount of uh, patient or volunteer data. I'm unsure on whether or not it's got patient data. I have our Siemens but there's about 15,000 um, people in this training data set of whole body images. And then finally, uh, Deep Resolve Swift Brain. So Deep Resolve Swift Brain is an extremely fast brain protocol, which takes about two minutes to acquire. And it picks out all the important sequences, T1 diffusion flare images. And these are acquired with uh, simultaneous multi-slice and Deep Resolve Boost applied. And they also have a, um, a multi-shot EPI sequence. Uh, where you can get T1 and T2 star images out at the same time simultaneously. So how do we go around implementing some of these techniques and uh, when you're at the scanner? So 
when we're talking about simultaneous multi-slice, I'm, I'm only going to talk about TSEs because these are the um, routine protocols that you're going to be wanting to use to shorten your acquisition time. And there's going to be multiple of these, uh, predominantly in MSK imaging. Um, I mentioned before, it's favorable that you've, you're using a dedicated coil. So some of the knee coils or the foot and ankle coils, where there's more coil elements, which allows you to separate out those applied slices. Again, the most uh, Siemens recommend, and uh, from experience, uh, SMS slice factor of two is the most reliable. But once you've applied it, then you can look at trying to reduce your TR or your concatenations to um, shorten that acquisition. And if you do have deep resolve boost, it is available um, on this sequence. And so it can be applied as well in addition uh, to boost your SNR. Um, there are other implementations I'm, I've not touched on, but they do improve um, the quality of images and benefits the patient in terms of the diagnostic imaging that they provide. For compressed sensing, the implementation, so in the Siemens tree, if you search the underscore CS in, um, in their tree, you'll be able to see these images, uh, sorry, see these scans. You need to be really careful. It gives a range of values of one to 100 uh, in terms of the compressed sensing factor. Too high a compressed sensing factor will lead to introducing sort of artifactual sequences if you put too much denoising. There's also, unfortunately, <laughs> which makes our job even more challenging, uh, a, a non-linear relationship between the CS factor you're using and the image quality. So because we're using an, uh, an iterative reconstruction and we're looking for a threshold, you know, in the first couple, uh, slide I showed on compressed sensing, um, you might find that certain factors produce better quality images than others. So it is a bit of a tried and tested approach. Um, it's best to not to go above 20. Um, some of these images here are, between one and I believe 15. So even going to 15, you can see a very blurry image of the brain. Again, it's space sequences are only in neuroradiology. People only use 3D predominantly. Of course, there are some, some you could use, but predominantly a lot of these sequences are found uh, in that. Again, there are other benefits I mentioned in terms of the cines and the other uh, images which do improve patient and image quality benefits, but not necessarily to accelerate images. Then for uh, deep resolve gain, sharp and boost, right? So this is fairly complicated. It mixes and matches. So the application is only on 2D TSCs for gain, but this does include Dixons. Um, and like, like I said, it's a denoising strength that you can adjust and there's an enhancement level as well that you can adjust. If you go to higher values of the, the denoising, you can potentially increase more blurring. For boost, it's applicable for 2D TSEs and also the spin echo sequences, the base sequences of spin echoes, but this now does not include Dixons. Um, the denoising strengths here are low, medium, and high. Um, I haven't presented this data, but there's some phantom work that was done in Leeds by Matthew who showed that. Um, the SNR using low is not sig significant boost. And so your best bet is to use medium or high. Uh, again, it will be tailored to what you want and how it's best suited for you. But again, using too high can also then lead to blurring. For deep resolve sharp, it can either be on or off. Um, so again, if you're recommended using boost and sharp, it's an intermix. You need to try and work out what works best for you and your site. So how do you do it when you deploy it um, to increase your patient throughput? Well, once you've turned it on, you then need to accelerate your imaging. So you could potentially reduce the number of averages, um, increase grapper, uh, again, for maximum probably three for gain and four for boost. Um, you then can reduce your phase resolution and your base matrix as well, because you are increasing it, particularly if you're using sharp you don't need to acquire so many, uh, your base metrics can be a bit smaller. So let's look at some of the images that we get out, sequences and the protocols that we can uh, obtain. So starting off, um, looking at simultaneous multi-slice, so this was some nice work done in the Northwest region. Um, 
when they first got the acceleration software a, a year and a half ago or so. Uh, they looked at optimizing their neck imaging with simultaneous multi-slice. So it's beneficial in the neck because you're using a head, dedicated head and neck coil, which is a lot of coil elements, which allows you to separate out. Um, the slice is better. Um, and you can see the, the amount of time that they saved uh, in terms of their acquisition. You might want to be careful. Uh, I've not got a huge amount of experience with simultaneous multi-slice, but you might want to have a bit more coil coverage in terms of when you're applying it because you're going to be exciting slices outside of your field of view. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. In terms of compressed sensing, so this is some work that Joe and myself did uh, here in London. Um, we acquired um, our 3D T1, T2 and T2 flare space scans, uh, our conventional with no compressed sensing, and you can see they're very, very long. Um, and then if we apply two different um, CS factors to these, we can really bring down the scan time and also maintain that image quality. So we can save 50% of time. But unfortunately, there's very limited sequences. So I'll give an example in our routine brain protocol. We only one, run one 3D sequence and I do two if there's contrast in given. And that's out of seven, seven sequences or five or seven sequences or so. So whilst it is good at accelerating, it needs to be combined together with some of the other acceleration techniques to really have that impact for neuroradiology. And then deep resolve. So this is where this is what Siemens will tell you, call you the game changer, really. So again, this is some nice work done by uh, Steve Jackson and Mike Hutton. So you're looking at the original PD fats that they have, as for a PD scan they have. So three minute scan. Doing the first generation of deep resolve gain and sharp, so when they had the XS20 software, they could save a fair amount of time, okay? They saved half, I don't know, half the time there, I haven't done the maths, right? But then if you go from the, the gain and the sharp and you go to the boost and the sharp, you can save even more time off it and still maintain that good image quality. So they showed here they saved 74% in terms of the acquisition time for the knee scan, which is quite impressive. And so what do we see here in terms of the deep resolve sharp and the gain and why it's beneficial? You can see that the, the boost in SNR is allowing you to recapture sort of this structure in the cartilage that you couldn't necessarily see. And if we look at the protocol that they optimized over time, they went from their original knee protocol in this hospital which was a 15 minute long scan, and they got it down to five, less than five minutes, obviously not accounting for time in between the scans. Uh, so you can see why it's impressive and why people are very interested in this technology. And then finally, um, a bit separate, Siemens uh, resolve, uh, Deep Resolve Swift Brain. So, um, it's taken out of the clinical tree um, if you search for swift brain. Um, it uses auto align, so it doesn't require any planning. Effectively, you just start the scan as long as you've ISIS entered them, and it will do the localizers and all the planning for you. So it's a touch of a button. There's no break in between. It takes two minutes to run. Um, and the images are of diagnostic quality. So I did run this uh, on a volunteer. It was incredibly quick. And then I showed it to a, a neuroradiologist here at our trust. Whilst I told them it was impressive, it was two minutes. They may not have been so impressed in terms of if this was run for all of our clinical scans. It's worthwhile potentially for something that you need to do quickly if your patient's claustrophobic or if it's a very quick scan just to check something. It's probably not always got its best uses when you're looking for small structures in the brain. So the challenges, I've spoken about all the great things about AAT that Siemens provide, but there are some challenges that do come with it. So what are these challenges? And then I'll step through them and show you some examples. Well, the way the algorithm works, it, it does mean that sometimes the images look a bit artificial. There's a bit too much smoothing. The images look a little bit too flat. Um, you can get increased patient uh, movement in the images and flow artifacts starting to appear. 
You can get the appearance of wrap in your images from Deep Resolve Boost. Um, and the challenge, as I've mentioned, is right, finding the right combination of using Deep Resolve and the other acceleration parameters that you have. So your TRs, the grappa factor you might use, the number of concats, the number of averages you might use. So it's finding the right combination and it it's not entirely um, obvious sometimes, and I'm not an expert in that, it's gonna be suited to your site, um, what's best. And then finally reconstruction times, which are also a challenge. So I was showing this example uh, by Sam in uh, the North Midlands. And in this case, um, the smoothing actually masked pathology, so in the knee. So you see this very small bit of pathology in the cartilage here. It's masked when you apply Deep Resolve Boost. So you do have to be incredibly careful about what you're using Deep Resolve Boost for and whether or not it's going to hide really, really subtle changes. Um, so again, it's, it's finding that optimum for that protocol and what you're looking for pathology wise, you might have different levels of smoothing that you want to apply to accelerate your sequences. So why do you get flow and motion artifacts now in um, accelerated imaging protocols? Well, it's actually the way we're acquiring through case space because we're now accelerating incredibly fast. So we might be using grappa factors of three or four that we wouldn't have routinely used before. Um, when there's motion or if there's flow, it starts to contaminate that case space more because you're skipping more lines of case space. So you then get to see these sorts of flow artifacts appearing and ghosting across your image. So again, you've got to be careful whether or not you apply some sort of flow compensation or you whether or not you look at a different um, combination of acceleration parameters. So the wrap artifact is a bit of an interesting one. So Siemens implementation of the AI algorithm has some form of sense reconstruction built into it. So whilst it does it in case base uh, applying, there is some form of sense reconstruction, which unfortunately means that when you use higher grappa factors, you can start to get wrap into your image. So you can see here on this spine, there's a bit of wrap coming in from somewhere. And this one's even more impressive, the one from Jose down at King's College Hospital. They were doing a rectum scan um, and a finger wrapped in. So you can actually see the patient's finger wrapped into the image. Um, so you need to use larger amounts of phase over sampling to overcome this. So you're going to be using up to like 200% phase over sampling to get around this. So it's quite a challenge and it's not quite intuitive um, for radiographers maybe to see why you need to use such a large phase over sampling than we routinely tend to uh, avoid the wrap artifact. Um, so you need larger phase over sampling. So you need to go to um, potentially up to 200% in terms of phase over sampling. Um, the higher grappa factors are beneficial when you've got dedicated coils, um, like a head coil or your knee coil or your ankle coil. But when it's coming to like using the spine coil, um, you've got a smaller distribution, you've got coil less coil elements and they're distributed a bit further apart. Um, so it gets a bit tricky in terms of it trying to figure out where they are. So we found actually that using grappa two is the maximum you can use when you're just using say the spine coil or the spine and the body coil. And then finally, um, reconstruction time. So probably what, manufacturers didn't tell you about was that actually doing all these fancy methods iterative reconstructions actually leads to longer reconstruction time so when we're looking at shortening the scans we might be doing that but we then might be adding in some reconstruction time so this does need to be taken into account and you may want to think about the way in which you order your sequences such that you're not waiting around for an image to reconstruct so you can plan the next scan so there needs to be a bit of consideration taken into how this works. And also to bear in mind that when you're choosing what your booking slot is, or, or your uh, whilst you might have shortened your acquisition time and your scanner shows that you've shortened it to 15 minutes, you've still got all this other time that you have to take into account. 
But what's the, the patient benefit to this service? Well, again, um, a site that's had it for a while now, they've done a lot of optimization, and I think they showed this image in, in the first webinar. They managed to actually accelerate quite a few of their images. So you can see the acquisition time in green for their AAT accelerated versus the blue with their original sequence. And you can see that they did shorten quite a few of their booking times. Notice they didn't change it for the routine brain. So even though they managed to save maybe five, three or four or five minutes, they didn't shorten that scan. So it's got to be data driven, but you can see that they did shorten some of their appointment slots. And they, it resulted in me able to scan more than hundred patients per month using the system. So there is a massive benefit of investing some time and learning how to use this technology to increase patient throughput. Summarize, well, Siemens have a range of different technologies. Um, their latest generation, their Deep Resolve Boost, um, has the most potential, but it is currently only limited to TSCs. Um, um, well, it's, now it's saying my internet's not stable for the first time. Um, <laughs> The Deep Resolve is only available, sorry, is only available in the latest generation of scanners, which is a bit of a problem as well. But, but watch this space. Uh, when XA60 comes out, it will be available on the Skyras and the Eras. So it is coming, it will take time, but it will then be beneficial for sites who have already installed these scanners um, and are not planning to replace them in the next five to 10 years. Yes. And the most important thing I think which will be banged on about by a lot of people is about having a, a structured framework for op optimization, working with radiographers, radiologists, and spending some time learning how the software works at your site, what you like, what you don't like, and spend that time, even if it does maybe eat into some patient scanning time, the benefits in the long run will be worth it. So just a, a reminder, we have recordings for all four um, webinars will be made available um, for anyone who has registered. We have a, a live website now. Um, I believe at the moment it's currently only available for IPEM members, but this is going to be changed. Um, and it provides a bit of advice in terms of what the technology is, um, which manufacturer we've got, which type of acceleration technique, what software versions it's available on, what the challenges are, where it works and some notes. And these will be updated over time as well. So as and when we get more and more information, as more and more people are using this software and feeding this information back, uh, we'll be able to update this. So with that, I'd just like to thank the task and finish group uh, and the rest of the team who provided slides. And of course, to the team here at Guys and St. Thomas's, uh, in particular, the radiographers, and the physics team here. Now, I am hoping my internet connection is stable because I have told Cameron what my next sneaky thing is. Live yeah, demo. I'm, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's looking good at the moment, Simon. I'll, I'll let yes. you know. I'll start waiting. Right. I do need to log into the connection, but it should take a no second. Worries, take your time. Right, here we go. So, Hopefully you can see my screen. So this is the Siemens interface um, of the scanner and we are able to, just, oh, why is it not going to full screen mode? Oh well, we'll leave it. Um, this is the Siemens interface. So let's look at where some of these acceleration techniques are in the scanner um, and what we can do. So the first one is where do you find simultaneous multi-slice images? So Siemens label these S2. And so you'll find in some of these, if you go into the libraries, you can find them in some of the diffusion sequences that they've been applied. And they've also been applied with a grapple acceleration. Um, you notice that even though they haven't applied it in the neck, I showed some images of the neck. So even though it's not been turned on in some of these, it, does, it will be there. You just need to turn it on. And I will show you where that is turned on once I find a TSC sequence. So if I go and pull out, I, I'll tell you what, I'll go to knee. If we go into a scan here, um, the simultaneous multi-slice is enabled. Oh, I need to go into edit mode.
There we go. There we go. So if we open it up, you can see instead of choosing grapper, you can move to simultaneous multi slice. Uh, you can then choose your grapper acceleration, so your phase encoding direction, and then your SMS factor. Again, if you do have deep resolve, you can turn it on. So that's where simultaneous multi slice is. If you want to look where compressed sensing is, it's labeled CS. I believe, not CD though. <laughs> Again, as I said, these are predominantly in neuroradiology and 3D sequences, and you can find these here. So a bit like the images I showed, this is a conventional T1 with Grappa 2. If you use CS4, you've accelerated it by four times instead of two. Um, it is found here. You shorten your sequence. So every time I do this on the scanner, I forget to go to edit mode. Um, you can find the compressed sensing here. So under CS instead of Grappa, and you can choose your factor in terms of your denoising. So we can go up to 25, but as I showed you before, you've got to be careful uh, going too high. Right. I will show you where Deep Resolve Swift Brain is. Um, so it is in head advanced clinical applications, Deep Resolve Swift Brain, and this is where the protocol is. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the sequences, but if you run this, it does take two minutes. I promise you, I did try it. So the final thing, and what I actually want to do, was show you how you actually go about trying to optimize a sequence with Deep Resolve Boost. So let's take a scan here. Uh, in the knee, and we'll take one of the T1 scans, um, and we'll take the coronal. Oh, I'm going to blend myself, do the edit mode. Go into the coronal T1 TSE. So, as I showed you before, if we go into the acceleration and we turn on deep resolve and we turn it on, notice it turns interpolation on. This is a requirement for the algorithm. But notice, as I turned it on and you're expecting a boost in SNR, really important point to note now is that the relative SNR doesn't change. So it's a pretty much becoming redundant. Um, and I know a lot of people use this when they're changing their protocols to sort of use this as a monitor. This is not in there now. If you click on the three dots, you can choose between going to gain and boost. Um, so if we go into gain, you have different levels of denoising, one to eight and one to five on enhancement. But as we're using boost, because we have it, you have medium, low and high. We'll leave it on medium and we'll keep sharp on. So now we've accelerated our protocol, but that time there never changed. So just by turning it on doesn't accelerate your imaging sequences. So we need to do something. Um, so the first thing I may, may do is turn grapple up. Um, to click away to allow it to enable. Um, it then switches some of the reference scans. But now you see we shorten the scan. So we've gone for three and, three and a half minutes to 250. We go to the front page and we notice there's quite a few averages here. Let's turn one of them down. And now we're down from a three and a half minute scan to a one and a half minute scan. So I've saved two minutes. I've not run this protocol, but I've done quite well, I think. There's a number of concatenations. Now we need to be careful. I, I did say changing it to one concatenation could work, but notice that the TR shoots up and we want a T1 weighted sequence. So we're not going to do that here. Um, but there are opportunities to change that. I would potentially now go run this scan and see what happens. I suspect we might have to increase the phase over sampling. We might have to play some fat sat bands in, and we might need to look at flow compensation as well which is hidden beneath sequence part one under flow comp. So that was that really. I just wanted to show you how you do it on the scanner and give you the sort of the, how it works out and how I would go about optimizing. Again, that might not be the best sequence, might not be, give you the best images, but it's a good place to where you should start. So let's take that out of the way. And I can hopefully, oh, well, I've gone too far. Leave okay. it to the questions and answers and um, 
Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah. First of all, thanks for having that presentation, Simon. Sorry your your internet didn't quite withstand it. I think it was really useful to actually have that practical demonstration. Uh, it definitely makes me want to have the uh, program editor, so I'm going to push and push and push for me to have access to that. So um, there's a couple of questions I've already sort of worked to answer. I'll just run a couple by you just to make sure that I've yep. said the right things. So to our understanding, am I right in saying that the deep neural network uh, for DR Boost was only trained on healthy volunteers and not on pathological images? I have asked Siemens repeatedly to clarify. Yeah. I've heard two different answers from two different people. So at ISM Rome, I asked this, and they did say that it is trained on some pathology. Okay. Um, but I didn't get out of them what it was. So again, it is one of those bit of those black boxes, unfortunately, that we yeah, don't yeah, yeah. quite know. Um, that's been our experience as well. So hopefully that's cleared up a bit more, uh, Iona. Uh, another attendee asked, um, how is DR Boost different from iterative reconstruction CS? Um, so it's, yeah. a, it's a deep learning algorithm. It's not using, um, so it's trained on paired data. So um, it's, that's where it's filled in, whereas the iterative re reconstruction from compressed sensing is not. It's just a denoising algorithm that is checking yeah. that it's removed the noise. Brilliant. Um, so into the some of the open questions, um, I was hoping there's a question on comparing uh, GE's AI offering to Deep Resolve Sharp. Um, I'm wondering if I'll be able to speak to uh, Martin Graves. So Martin <laughs> Graves gave the last talk. Um, I might in allow him to talk if he's willing to give us a bit more of a background to that question. <laughs> Way to put you on the spot, uh, Martin. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Martin. Sorry, I've been oh. messaging Martin in the Q&A. <laughs> uh, I was going to try and write something, but it's easier to, to talk. Um, so, so the question was um, deep resolve sharp. So, I yeah. mean, I think the GEAI is probably, as far as I can tell from what we've seen there, is, is a deep neural network. So... I think so I'm trying to get my heads around from, from listening to, to Simon. It's, it's probably similar to Deep Resolve Boost then. Yeah, would you agree with that, Simon? It's a neural network. It's denoising yeah. the images. Now, the subtle thing that I found from doing some phantom experiments is that the, the improvement in spatial resolution, or at least what I've seen in the phantom, is primarily arises because I don't know if I mentioned this last week or not is primarily arises because they are turning off the raw data filter so the raw data filter on GE is there to reduce the Gibbs ringing but it also induces a degree of blurring you know it rolls off at the edges of case space so if you turn off the raw data filter then the image of a resolution phantom looks identical to what you get with the um, with the GE's Air Recon DL. So I'm not convinced that there's any DL really in that um, aspect of it. Um, but what the DL does is reduce the amount of ringing artifact that comes because we've turned off that filter. Um, and also boosts the signal to noise ratio through, you know, through teaching the, the algorithm, probably similar to the way that Siemens or Simon described with Siemens, that they take an image, they then artificially um, reduce its resolution and then train the network the other way around, taking the low resolution data to go back to the, um, the high resolution original data but they also add noise into the low resolution data, I think artificially, and then you know, train it to go back to the, to the relatively high SNR, um, high resolution um, data that was, that was, required, that was you know, acquired routinely in subjects um, as their training data. Does that, um, does that make sense? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think, yeah, the, the main difference we were interested in was the difference. Uh, yeah, basically yeah. comparing so, it as an AI technique to DR boost, which is exactly what you said. 
Yeah, so you know, GE just have a you know Air Recon DL. Um, they have three settings on it. Um, another, you know, the big thing again, which we, which maybe people didn't realise clearly from from last week's talk, is that at the moment, um, GE have it in two D and three D modes, but they do not do any sub sampling. Okay. There's no sub sampling at all, so there's no you know, compressed sensing type recon in there as well. It's entirely taking um, data and giving you an SNR boost. So, you know, we we can do two millimeter thick um, 2D slices, which would previously have been so noisy that we wouldn't have done them. But now yeah. we can do them because we're getting the noise improvement and a bit of uh, improvement in spatial resolution as well. Brilliant. That's really good to know. Thank you very much for, for stepping in, Martin. I'm aware that uh, a lot of us in the working party have our different specialisms based on what scanners we have Abs access to. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> it is, it's it's very confusing. You know, the manufacturer, so it's the same as this, and it and it's and it's not. Um, yes. You know, I mean, I think the Siemens stuff is, is yeah, the Siemens acronyms. stuff is is particularly complex. I think with all these different boosts yeah, and sharps. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I'll group a couple of questions about uh, DR Swift Brain. Uh, so, Simon, I've got a question on whether DR Swift Frame will run, run in other orientations or whether it's locked to the orientation of the protocol set, I assume. Uh, I suspect it's not going to be locked. The, 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 the way, the way uh, Auto Align works is it picks up which way you've orientated it. But I've, not checked, I've not checked on the, the Swift Frame, but my knowledge of uh, AAT, uh, sorry, not AAT, Auto Align. Um, <laughs> uh, Lots of acronyms. In, lots of acronyms. Yeah, is that you can. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, the other question about DR was talking about which of the which of the DR packages does it use? Uh, I think it's That's, DRB, right? Yeah, uh, I believe so. I tried to look up and find actually because it is lo it, it is locked on the protocol. Uh, I can't okay. get the thing up. It just says it's using Deep Resolve, and you can't see what it's using. <laughs> Um, that's always good. <laughs> my, my guess is it is using some form of deep resolve boost. Unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> Again, uh, it comes back to those things, not knowing what the manufacturers have done. Excellent. Um, maybe a question about m maybe how we we might have collectively phrased at certain parts of the presentation. Uh, Rose is asking whether deep resolve deep resolve boost is available with uh, SE because of its compatibility with Grappa. I think. Uh, yeah, so so spin echoes sense, and yes. don't yeah the base yeah. sequence for spin echoes doesn't allow you to use grapper, no. but it does uh, allow you to use deep resolve boost. Ah, that's a good, very well cleared up. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, there is a question on uh, using phantom measurements to test the AI methods. There was a really good presentation, I'd say, at the protocol optimization conference recently about that. Um, it might be worth us trying to dig that up and speak to you uh, out of this, uh, Owen. But thank you very much for your question. I was going to also add we we are looking into that here. So yeah, I'm sure we it's, can discuss Owen. Um, we are looking. It yes. was and I know that another. Uh, so I um, I didn't have a slide on it. I did remove it. But some work done in Leeds as well looked at the phantom uh, measurements. Yeah. Cool. Uh, sort through all these lots of questions um good question by jonathan so we've got um given the oversampling and grapper limitations on dr boost the body is it worth focusing on this as an image quality aid rather than a time saving aid so maybe that's just a general question about what are your attitudes to using yeah um dr boost as a image quality improver rather than a time saver uh yeah that's that's true. I think um, people. I've I've spoken to a few of the people who have the software now, and a, a few sites are actually using it to boost their SNR and get better image quality, even though it was purchased to achieve uh, shorter sequences. Um, so yes, there's definitely that option out there. Yeah, but in your practical experience, maybe of, of in any of the sort of DR boosts using the body, would you? Are yeah. we finding that there's less time saving available there just because of the limitations or is it or are we actually getting some successes? Um, I have seen successes. I've seen people use it both ways, to be honest. That's so, good to know. 
it, it depends on your site it depends on your site and the way you've optimized your protocols and a really interesting point is you're obviously going to be starting from different points the way in which a site optimizes a protocol so just in that slide that i showed for the deep resolver of the knee and it was the work done in northwest region well our knee, knee protocol here at guys and st thomas's starts off at 10 minutes so if we optimized it and shortened it we're not going to be saving the 74 percent of time because our sequences are only 10 minutes. So it's going to be where your starting point is as well, which is really important to remember. No, absolutely. And bearing in mind patient preparation time and not just halving uh, pro yeah, imaging slots. Um, uh, just a quick follow up on the question that Rose posed about the use of DR Boost for uh, SE images. Uh, Rose has asked that does, does Boost require Grappa? Well, let me, I can't find my remote desktop. I can just tell you the answer if I can open it. Um, if you go to the next question, I can tell you the answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Sarah's asked about um, like the training for the deep neural network. She's asking about if uh, the training has been done on a particular coil, uh, is it disastrous to use a similar sequence on a different part of the body? Or a different coil, or on a phantom, does it does it fall apart when we try and take it out of its wheelhouse? Essentially, I don't know the answer to that question, really. Yeah. To be honest, I, that yeah. would be come from experience, from what what people go out and use and feedback. To be honest, I think that's um, that's what I was going to say. Is in we've we've got some hopefully the the, the presentations that we're doing and the uh, resources that we're going to provide give a bit more of a sort of practical implementation guides to avoid some of these issues but uh yeah we are we're finding a lot of crossing that bridge <laughs> crossing that bridge when we come to it um sorry i'm just reading some of the other questions so uh martin's uh asked some questions about um uh oh the example that sam gave the sam sam butler gave about the loss of diagnostic information um so have we had any um, confidence issues with radiologists worrying about miss, missing, missing pathology? Or um, has that ever come up at your trust, uh, Simon? Or is that just something that we, we're using as an example from uh, Sam and so, his colleagues? So Sam gave that presentation at uh, the IPEM conference about a month ago. Um, so that's where I have obtained it from. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's a good example of you could be concerned, really. Um, again, it, it's yeah, it, it does come down to how how well you can trust what it's doing. But is it is it the same as just accelerating your images, or doing um, acquiring smaller matrices such that you don't get good quality images to miss pathology? I guess that's one way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, and continually monitoring and just making sure that we're. Yeah, aware of these issues uh, from radiology feedback, a uh, radiologist feedback. Um, okay, what else we've got? Um, ooh, lots and lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, yeah, so Rose's, Rose's uh, um, mentioned a bit more about the uh, use of Grappa. So to Rose's understanding, um, DR boost require, uh, relies on a self sense algorithm, so you can't use it without Grappa. Do you know if that's correct at all, Simon? Have you managed to dig out the information? Uh, I've got to say I've not used it uh, uh, before. You can. Okay. You can turn on Deep Resolve. Um, you can turn on Deep Resolve gain uh using spinnaker i might have got that the wrong way around in my slides oh, yeah i was talking about boost yeah i've got it the wrong way around yes so deep resolve gain you can use on spinnakers um and this is why it's so confusing with different <laughs> acronyms from siemens deep resolve gain you can use for spinnakers okay cool that's answered that that's brilliant oh it's like whack -a -mole. um ah perfect glad that glad that helped rosa um so Martin's asked, um, one of our slides said, or one of your slides, I should say, give you the credit you deserve, uh, said Deep Resolve um, had an impact on smoothing. Which of the DR uh, methods was that? 
I can't remember from your presentation that we're talking about smoothing. I, be... I, I believe it would have been a comp. It would have, the, the sequence was a combination of deep resolve boost and sharp. I'm hoping maybe Sam might be on this call and he can answer. Um, oh, is this the smoothing for the for Sam's example? Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. But I you'll remember. get you'll get blur you'll get blurring for deep resolve boost and gain, um, yeah, because it's a denoising algorithm. Unfortunately, I can't see Sam on no, this call. Okay, can't call him out. <laughs> but I, do, <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember him talking about it at the presentation. They were talking about because a lot of this process, is, as we're learning, is is relying on radiologist feedback for the quality of images that they want. And one of the things that I found was quite interesting about his talk was, from a medical physics point of view, we can get like these. Um, yeah, images that we suspect are high quality and really good for diagnosis, but um, they don't, uh, radiologists don't necessarily want smooth images or want smooth images, or they have a, they have a different sort of quality metric than we may have as uh, medical physicists. Um, apologies, we can't answer that for you, Martin, but um, you can definitely feed back to Sam and I think he'll be willing to talk to you about that. Um, I don't think any of the other present, any of the other questions will be necessary to cover. Um, but I, I do agree with you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely something that we should consider, um, like the limitations of certain call arrangements for DR, uh, especially for CS. Um, and yeah, Victor, there's probably uh, better methods for optimization than we than we <laughs> quickly ran through, but um, yeah, lots of lots of fiddling and playing around and just finding what what's best for our uh, radiologists. So I'll just say those as answered. Brilliant. Um, we're just after half past, so it's probably good to bring this uh, presentation to a close. Uh, as I said before, uh, as we said a couple of times, the webinar has been recorded. It will be made available online uh, at a later date and uh, hope you learned a lot and hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for coming.